I'll give you a quote. Ben, ben Franklin said, He that lives upon hope will die fasting. Um, it's a pretty profound statement. He that lives upon hope will die fasting, meaning you're going to die hungry if that's the only sustenance that you get is what you're hoping for. Another very famous man said this, He that lives upon biblical hope will die well fed. That was said by Kevin Wooten. I don't know if y'all know him or not. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I thought about it, and I thought about the difference there. There is a hope that this world has, and then there's a hope that the Bible teaches us. The biblical hope will feed our souls. The biblical hope will cause us, when our time comes, to die well fed. Paul talks a lot about hope. He uses, the Greek word that's used is spelled, and I don't know if it matters, E-L-P-I-S, elpis. Uh, and it's used 36 times in 13 epistles. So it's important that, that we understand what it means to have hope. And Paul talks about it throughout his epistles. Well, what is our hope? Look in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Our hope is in Jesus Christ. Our hope is not in anything that the world has to offer. You know, we're coming up on an election in 50-some days or around 50 days. We're going to decide who the next president of the United States is going to be, as well as some senators and congressmen and women. And Pretty important election as to the direction of this country and, and where it's going to be going and how we're going to be governed for the next four years. I would say it's a very important election. But our hope is not in who wins that election. If we know what the Bible says about this world. We live in an evil world. We live in a sin-cursed world. So our hope is not going to be placed in a politician. It's not, it, it's not going to be placed in your family. Your families, they will let you down. Family members will, sometimes they mean to, sometimes they don't. They're human. They'll let you down. Our hope is not in our family. Our hope is not in religion. Religion is something that man has attached to God's Word. And whatever the denomination may be, they all say, we have, we're right. We have the doctrine that's correct. Follow us. Listen to us. And you'll understand and you'll know what's right. We'll give you hope. Religion's not going to give you hope. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. And that hope is found in the words of a King James Bible. You want to have hope in this world. You want to be well fed in this world. Then have your hope placed in the correct person. And that person should be Jesus Christ. Now I'm not telling you not to vote, not to vote because I plan on voting as many times as I can. I'm just kidding. I don't, if that goes out there, don't send anybody to my house. But I encourage you to do that. But that's not our hope, folks. Our hope is in Jesus Christ because this life is going to end at some point. Now the word hope is it's used, you know, oftentimes people hear that word and they think that word means um, I don't know if it's going to happen, but I will be happy if it does. That's the way they look at hope. And that's not what hope is. You know, is it, is it going to be pretty tomorrow? Well, I hope so. Don't really know if it's going to be pretty tomorrow, but I'm expecting that maybe it will. There's no confidence in that hope. That's not the hope, the biblical hope, that we have in Jesus Christ. Look back in Romans. Turn to Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8. In verse, in verse 18, Paul says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. That phrase there in verse 19, the earnest expectation. That's the hope that Paul's talking about. You earnestly expect it to happen. That's the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ went to a cross and on that cross He died for your sins and He died for my sins. He was buried. He was raised the third day from the tomb. And He ascended up 
And he sits at the right hand of the Father now. We have faith in that. We place our trust in that. And we believe that if we place our faith and trust in that, that at some time in this future, God is going to save our never dying souls. We're not saying it like, I sure do hope that it's pretty tomorrow. No, we expect it to happen. It's an earnest expectation. Look with me in the book of Colossians. Turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 21. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not mo uh, moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Paul here says that you at one time were enemies, and that you is the collective. He's not talking to an individual, he's talking to the collective, everyone. At one time you were enemies to God, but now you're not. You've been reconciled by the death of His Son. You are no longer at odds with God, or God is no longer at odds with you. The death of Jesus Christ reconciled you, brought you to Him. And He says there in verse 23, And be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. You see, it is the gospel of Jesus Christ that gives us hope. It is what I said to you a few moments ago, that He died for you, that He was buried, that He rose again the third day. He did that for you, for your sins, so that you could have eternal life. That is the hope that we preach to this world. That is the hope that this world needs. You know, presidents come and presidents go. But your soul is going to endure forever. You know, I'm 53 years old. And it just seems like yesterday I was 23 years old. It, time just it goes like that. The oldest... Wooten in my family tree that I could find, he lived to be 104 years old. He died in 1950. He was the oldest living resident in Iredell County at the time of his death. His name was Adolphus Gustavus Wooten. It's a mouthful. But he was 104 years old. And I said, I'm going, my plan is to outlive Adolphus. And I want to live to be 105. That was, you know, I'm 53, do the math. If I live to be 105, half my life is already over. Even if I live to be 105. What is 100 years compared to eternity? People, you know, we, we think, we think, and I say we meaning me, we think in terms of the now. We don't really think about eternity. Why? Why? Because it's out there somewhere in the future. It's not until we are pressed into thinking about it that it becomes a reality to certain people. And a lot of times that has to do with your health. It has to do with a loved one and their health. And then we begin to consider and we begin to think about those things. Most of the time we're not concerned with it. A hundred years on this earth seems like a long time. Benjamin Franklin lived to be 84, I believe it was. I quoted him as a star. He lived to be 84 years old, died... I'm going to say sometime around the year 1800, I don't remember. But he's been dead for over 200 years. He's been dead twice as long as he lived. Eternity is forever. And we don't give it very little thought. But the hope that we have is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is the one thing that this world is neglecting. Not just those that don't believe, but churches in general. The gospel is second fiddle anymore. It's entertainment. How can we entertain the masses? How can we bring them in? How can we keep them happy? What kind of programs do we have for them so that they will come to our church and they never feed their soul? You want to die well fed, die believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 5.
Now this hope that we have is a twofold hope. One is eternal life. And I don't know how to put this other than to just say loved ones. You know, we were having a conversation the other day and we were talking about Alzheimer's and how, that, how terrible it must be to be hit with that disease, to where you lose the thoughts and the memories that you have created over a lifetime. And at the end of our life, all we really have is memories. The things that we have done, the people, the relationships that we have created, those that we have associated with throughout our lives, how terrible it must be to the individual who loses that and to the family member who sees them on a daily basis and that person doesn't recognize them. And they have to try and communicate with someone that they have loved and has been dear to them their whole life and that person doesn't recognize them and does not know them. How, how, how terrible that must be. Hold 2 Corinthians, look in 1 Corinthians. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We have the hope of eternal life, but we also have the hope of seeing those loved ones again. Those people that have gone on before us, the ones that have died in Christ, we have that hope of seeing them again. And look what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 12. I'm sorry, verse 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. That gives you hope. You want to talk to somebody who is dealing with Alzheimer's in their family? Share that verse with them. That will feed their soul. This person that doesn't remember you now, there's a day coming when they will know you as you are known. When you get to heaven, you're not going to say, what's that person's name? I can't remember them. You're going to know it. You will be known as you were known. That's, a, that's an encouragement. That is something that should give us hope. We have, you know, I lost my dad in 2007. Lost my father-in-law in 2017. Would love to speak to both of those men again. Someday I will. Someday in the future, I will speak to them as though nothing has ever happened. I will walk up and have a conversation with them and know them as I knew them here. That gives us hope. There's hope in the gospel, folks. Jesus Christ did everything for us. We have absolutely nothing we have to do in order to be saved. And yet people reject that message on a daily basis. Why? Tell me why a person would reject the greatest gift man has ever been offered. What is the reason? I don't have the answer. Pride. Maybe it's not being preached. But there is hope that will feed your soul. Jesus Christ died for you, was buried, raised again the third day so that you could have eternal life and that so that someday you could spend it with those that you love. That should give us hope. That should give us encouragement. That should feed our souls. Look back with me now in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I tell you what, let's read verse 18 of chapter 4. He says, while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You see, folks, we focus on the temporary, and that's just human nature. Everything that we see, everything that we associate with is physical. It's temporal. It's going away. But the things that are eternal... They're going to last forever. You can, man can create, man has made some amazing things. He's made some things that are just very simple. But without taking the time to maintain those things, you know what's going to happen to them? They're going to fall apart. They're going to decay. I don't care what they're made out of. Iron rusts. Wood rots. 
Whatever man makes will decay and fall away at some point unless it's maintained. It doesn't last forever. It's temporal. Paul says, the things which are seen, they're temporal. The things that are not seen, those things are eternal. And those are the things that we should focus on. And yet we don't. I don't. We should be banking on the eternal. I don't. I'm honest with you. My, my mind, my days are filled with the things of this world and the things of my flesh. And they occupy my thoughts on a daily basis to where I spend very little time thinking about the things eternal. When those are the things that are going to last. Talk to those people if you could. You know, I always, I'll give my students sometimes a writing prompt. And it'll be, if you could recall three people from the past who are no longer living, has to be a hundred years or longer back, three people that you could have breakfast with one morning, all sitting around the table with you, what three people would you choose? And it's amazing the, the people that they'll come up with. But the thing that I try to point out to them is that those people, their life is just, was a vapor and when, you take, when you think about eternity. It is forever. It doesn't end. And yet we spend so much time banking on the physical and not banking on the eternal so that the balances are way out of whack. I mean, I'm honest with you. I do the same. You know, I'm preaching to the choir, as they say. It's easy to get caught up in this world. It's easy to get caught up in the things that are temporary because that's the world that we live in. But the world that is to come is a world that is eternal and it's never going away. Those men that died back there, those women that died back there, they're in eternity. And their lives, however long or short they were, are nothing compared to what is ahead. And it's the same with us. How are we spending our days? Are we banking on the eternal or are we just banking on the temporary? He goes on to say in chapter 5 in verse 1, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. For, or if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Paul tells us here, look, this body that you're in, this earthly tabernacle, it's going to dissolve. Doesn't matter what you do. Eat, eat right, exercise, do everything you're supposed to do. You know what's going to happen in this flesh at some point? It's going to rot. It's going to decay. It's not going to be anymore. But he tells us that we have, we've got one made without hands, and it's eternal in the heavens. He likens it to putting on and taking off clothes. And so, you know, most of us when we get home today, we're going to take off the uncomfortable clothes that we wear to church, a lot of us, and we're going to put on the shorts or the jeans that are, you know, the go-to item that you have for sitting around the house on Sunday after you've eat so that, you know, it's not too tight in this area and you can, you know, expand whatever it is we do. That's, that set of comfortable clothes that you have. Why do we do that? Because they've been tried and we know that they are comfortable. Somebody buys you a, an outfit or a, a pair of pants or a shirt from the store and they bring it to you and you haven't tried that on. It's probably not what you're going to put on to sit around the house today. Why? You're not too sure of how that fits. You don't, you don't know that much about it. It's kind of how we are with our physical and our spiritual. We're comfortable in this flesh. You know, we sit around in it all the time. That house that's made without hands, the one that's eternal in the heavens, we've never tried that on. We don't know how that's going to feel. Nobody has left this life and when it experienced that outfit and then come back and compared it to this one. We know how this flesh feels because we wear it around all day, every day. And none of us want to lose it. He says there in verse 4, it, it, twice he says we groan. We are torn between two worlds, between the physical and the spiritual. In verse 4 he says, For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed. What does that mean? To die. Nobody in their right mind wants to die. 
I don't. People that say, you know, how many times have we heard people say, boy, I wish the rapture would take place today? You've heard that. I've said it. You ever heard somebody say, boy, I wish I'd die today? People don't say that, do they? People want to be in heaven. They just don't want to experience what it's going to take to get them there unless it's in the rapture. So Paul says, we're not wanting to really be unclothed, but to be clothed upon. We want that spiritual body. We just don't necessarily want to do what happens to get us to that spiritual body. Why? Because we don't, we've never experienced it. We don't know what it's going to be like. And so things that we don't know about, we tend to fear. And we fear death. Most people fear death. When Paul and, and the, the writings that he has here for, they give us everything needed not to fear it. To have hope in that next life. In that eternal life. The one that's not going to end. And if I could stress anything this morning, it would be understand that next life has no ending. It goes on forever. Whether it's in the presence of the Lord doing His business or in the other place. There's no ending. It goes on and on and on. Which one are you building bank for? The temporal or the eternal? Look with me and flip back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Hold, hold 2 Corinthians there. We're going to come back. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, my pages are sticking on me here. There we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, let's begin reading in verse 35. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, thou which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not the body, that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased Him, and to every seed His own body. When you go out and you plant corn, or you plant peas, or you plant whatever it is that you're planting, you don't plant what's going to come up. You don't. You plant, if you plant corn, you plant a kernel of corn, and a stalk grows. And on that corn stalk, there's an ear... <clears throat> And on that ear, hundreds of kernels of corn. But that kernel that you put in the ground has to die and germinate before the other comes up. And he's given us that analogy to our bodies. What you put in the ground is nothing, you understand? Nothing compared to what comes out of the ground. Put in a watermelon seed. Does a watermelon seed grow up? Or does a vine come up? And on that vine, big, huge watermelons, if you cultivate them correctly. What we plant is nothing compared to what's going to come up. Same way with us, folks. This body is nothing compared to the body that we're going to have. We're going to have one fashioned like His glorious body, the Bible tells us. Jesus, He told, He said, Fill me, fill my hands. A spirit hath not flesh and bone. He had flesh and bone. But yet he was able to travel, boom, and out of here he went. He was able to walk through walls. I don't know how he did it. He came into the room where they were and stood with them. He ate fish. Our body's going to do that. But it's, this body is nothing compared to the body we're going to have. That gives us hope. Think of, think of the individual who was born into this world with some kind of debilitating disease where they never knew what it was like to walk. Their whole life they've been pushed around in a wheelchair. What hope would it be for them to think, the next life my body's going to be just like that? Or the individual maybe that was born blind and they couldn't see. They don't know the beauty in God's creation. Or they can't hear or speak. Or the different things that these bodies, these sin-cursed bodies have wrong with them. What hope, what comfort would it be to know that in eternity I'm going to have a body just like this one? That's no hope. That's no comfort. But this book gives us comfort in knowing that the bodies we're going to have are nothing like the bodies that are going to be put into the ground. They're going to be amazing. The things that we're going to be able to do to exist in space, to travel, 
Read about what the Lord did there after He was raised from the dead, and you'll see the kind of body you're going to have. Look on with me in verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body. And there is a spiritual body. He goes on to say in verse 50. Now I, this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And he goes on down to say, finally, in verse 54, <clears throat> So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass that saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Look back in, in verse um, 25. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. He's going to destroy it. He has defeated it. And the Christian doesn't experience it. Those that are saved in the body of Christ won't experience death. Why? He experienced it for us. It is appointed unto man once to die. Jesus Christ died our death. If you're saved, when your body shuts down, your heart stops beating, the brain waves are no longer there, you're just going to drift off into a sleep, according to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says those that sleep in Jesus. It's going to be a peaceful rest. And at some point in the future, when that trumpet sounds, they'll raise from that rest. They'll come back with Him in the clouds. And we will, those of us that are alive, will go up to meet them in the air. And then there together we'll meet the Lord. There's comfort in that. Those of us that have lost people that we love, there's comfort in knowing we're going to see them again. That hope is not just eternal life. It is a life with those that we love who have gone on to be with the Lord and those that we will know as they were known. There's comfort in that to me. I hope there's comfort in that to you. Look with me back in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So he gives a believer hope. He says there in verse 2 Corinthians chapter 5, <clears throat> in verse 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. That verse is a, it's a parenthetical verse. It's, it's encap, encapsulated with parentheses, meaning it's an afterthought. And it's put in there to explain or help you understand the verses that come before it and the verses that come after it. Understand, Paul saying, we walk by faith, not by sight. Why is it important that the believer have hope? Because we walk by faith, not by sight. Our, everything that we have, folks, is tied up in faith. I believe this book to be the Word of God. Therefore, I believe the words in it are the words of God. Therefore, I believe those words when they tell me that I have a life waiting for me and I have a house not fashioned with hands, eternal in the heavens. It gives me that hope. But we walk by faith. We've never seen it. No one in this room has spoken to a person who has died and gone on. I don't care what the psychics tell you. I don't care what you ate and you dreamed about one night. You have not spoken to anyone who has gone on to be with the Lord. He's there. She's there. They haven't come back. We've never seen them. We don't know what it's like. We have never experienced it. So it becomes something that's terrifying to people. Paul said we walk by faith, not by sight. Look in verse 14. <clears throat> For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. The love of Christ constraineth us, meaning it motivates us. It gives us purpose. It gives us reason to go out and do what we do. And we have determined, Paul says, <coughs> that if He died for us, 
we should live for Him. He, the Bible says, is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Jesus Christ can't die anymore. But understand, the people that were going to take this message out were going to suffer. They were going to be beaten. They were going, some of them die for what they were preaching. The Apostle Paul, what happened to him? Had his head cut off. The apostles who, you know, they were in a different organization, if you want to put it that way. The things that they were saying and doing were different than what we're doing, but they still were punished for it. They were crucified. They were stoned. They were boiled in oil. All the different things, people who associate themselves with this book for the past two, 400 years, since 1611 when it came out, have suffered tremendously. And he says here in verse 16, Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we Him no more. Now I have used this verse, and others I've heard use it as well, and I'll continue to use it, to show that Jesus Christ had a twofold ministry. He had a ministry in His flesh that was to the nation Israel, and He had a, a ministry to the body of Christ, <clears throat> which was a mystery revealed to the Apostle Paul. And in the flesh, Jesus Christ came to Israel. He did not come to us. And we don't follow Jesus Christ after His earthly ministry. And that's an application we make out of those verses. But the literal interpretation of this verse has to do with death. He says, read it again, verse 16. Wherefore, now look back in verse, actually verse 14. The last two words, all dead. Verse 15, the last two words, rose again. He's dealing with death and resurrection. And then in verse 16 he says, Wherefore hence we, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. After the flesh, folks, is death. After your flesh, you're dead. And we know no man after the flesh. He goes on to say, Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh. How do we know that? Three times he presented himself to, the, to his apostles. He spoke with them. He taught them. He ate with them. But then he says, Yet now, henceforth, know we him no more. Why? He's seated at the right hand of the Father. When Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 1 left this, left terra firma and he went up, he has not been back down. He has been in the heavens at his rightful place seated on the throne. He came down and stopped and appeared brighter than the noonday sun in Acts chapter 9 to the Apostle Paul. But he didn't set foot. There's no mentioning of him putting his feet on this earth. The next time his feet hit this earth, he's going to split a mountain open with them. And he's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And this world is not going to want what he's bringing when he comes then. These people that mock and make fun now, let them have their time. Because I promise you they won't mock and make fun when he comes as the lion. But he says, we know no man after the flesh. We have no knowledge of anybody after they have died. But we have known about Jesus because he rose from the dead. And he, therefore he says in verse 17, <clears throat> Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That's the way, behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation was given to us to give to others. Why? Because Jesus Christ is not here. He is up in the heavens. He can't do it. He can't suffer for it. It was given to us. And he goes on to say in verse 19, To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. We are His ambassadors here on this earth. We should be the ones, we should be the light to this world, sharing this gospel, this good news, that they can have eternal life, that they can have that, re, uh, that reunion at some point with their loved ones who have gone on to be with the Lord. That gives people hope. It feeds the soul. And you'll die well fed if you dwell in that hope and not man's hope. A couple more verses. 
Titus chapter 1. In Titus chapter 1, in verse 1. Wow, time gets away from you up here. Titus chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. You want to be godly? Godliness is not, you know, in the way that you're living your life. Godliness, scriptural godliness, is acknowledging the truths of this book. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. If He promised it before the world began and He cannot lie, then what kind of hope is that? It's an earnest expectation, isn't it? It's going to happen. But hath in due times manifested His Word through preaching. How do we get that hope out? Through preaching. Preach the Word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. We preach this hope to a lost and dying world. We show them that there's something else in this world other than hatred and violence and all the negativity that's going on. There's positive in this world and it's in this book. It's in this book. One last passage. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 again. 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> I love this. One of my favorite passages in the Bible. It goes from the lowest of lows to the highest of highs. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 15. Yea, <clears throat> and we are found false witnesses of God. Because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ or not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Meaning you're not going to see them again. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. That's that hope Ben Franklin was talking about. You'll die fasting. But that next verse, But now is Christ risen from the dead and became or become the first fruits of them that slept. That's that biblical hope that will feed your soul. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He's not in that tomb. He's not in the ground rotting. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And that gives us hope. If Jesus Christ rose from the dead and God promised eternal life, then we have that earnest expectation that we can have it too. Based upon what Jesus Christ did for us. The Bible tells us that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You know, I hear people say, my faith is weak. You know what you've done when you say that? You've told on yourself. Is your faith weak? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Your faith is only as strong as you are close to this book. You want faith? You want hope, earnest expectation? Get closer to God. How do you get closer to God? Get closer to the book. Don't tell on yourself. Have a strong faith. Have hope of eternal life. And at some point out there in the future, those that you've lost and have gone on to be with the Lord, you're going to see them and you're going to know them as they were known and they're going to know you. And that's a blessing. You are at liberty to go.